So my name is John Fastabend. Um, I'm at Isovalent, now part of Cisco. I'm going to talk about Tetragon, um, but before they do that, um, because this is the BPF Summit and it's fun, I'll have another screen. All right. So, oh, password. Dang. Can you make it slightly bigger? So, no, no, you don't need to see this. This is loading Tetragon. On, if anybody, does anybody know like the game of life? Yes. Okay, cool. So. I don't know what happened. I'm on the wrong screen. Sorry. Let's see. There we go. So, Tetragon, the, the organization of Tetragon is it has a bunch of sensors, and you can, like, it's like a plug in system. You can plug in whatever you want. So, I, I plugged in the game of life just because it's also Turing complete, and last year we did this, like, string manipulation thing that was kind of fun. So, this time I'm going to run game of life. Um, of course, because it was interesting, I hooked it up to uh, a C group filter. So, you send it a magic packet, which we'll do. And then um, it basically starts this game of life. Uh, and what Game of Life is, if you're not familiar, is it's a um, it's a simple game where you build like a, a board um, here, like a, a a map of x by y fields, and then there's a set of simple rules that govern if the the square is white or black. Um, and it basically, what's interesting about it is it it will run forever, and it will kind of generate these interesting patterns over and over again. Um, uh, and basically what this is, is it's a BPF program that has a map that has the game board on it. Um, and then I'm just visualizing the game board in user space every two seconds. So um, just another example of uh, kind of a fun little uh, gimmick you can do with BPF. So. There you go. We actually did this at the KubeCon, um, which is a CNCF cloud native thing. Um, I was sort of a pre way to talk about like modern BPF can do loops, it can do timers, like all the stuff that we were just talking about earlier today. Um, you know, stop writing inline in your functions and stuff like this. Um, so this is cool. I'll get back to the actual talk. Um, actually, I'll leave it running, and we can see if I how good I am at programming, and see if it's still running when I come back to. Back to it. Maybe. Let's see here. And here we go. All right. So back to the to the real talk. So I'm going to talk about Tetragon. Um, Tetragon is a um, kind of this tool we built for security and observability and runtime enforcement. Mostly, I'm going to talk about the BPF side. So it's like. This is just a slight intro to give you some perspective on where I come from. We're not going to talk too much about Tetragon, really. We're going to talk about like the BPF problems and things we're solving. But the um, kind of the, the sort of makeup of it is, as I mentioned, is there's a bunch of plugins you can load into the into the loader, which will then manage distributing all the programs into like large clusters. So if you have thousands and thousands of nodes, it gives you a way to push those programs out to the out to the cluster. It gives you a way to collect the data out of them. So we. We basically read data out of the kernel through maps and perf rings and ring buffers if we can. And we shove that into either a database or a gRPC feed. Um, so kind of as a system, you might imagine you have these thousands and thousands of systems. They're all running Tetragon. Um, you're loading a set of BPF programs. Those BPF programs are then generating events. The user space then populates that into a gRPC stream or a database. Um, why we started this program um, was, it, I think it's kind of interesting. If you look, if we sort of looked around and we realized there's a, like a ton of very simple questions in the world that are not answered. <laughs> um, so an example would be what executed on my systems. Um, in general, people just don't know. Um, they don't have a good sense at, at scale, you know, what's running in their, in their network. Um, another one would be like, what have I connected to um, in the last day? Give me a list of all the all the bytes sent to a to a DNS name or something. So like that's kind of the stuff that Tetragon does. Uh, what files have I opened? Kind of that whole model is, is is what Tetragon does. We have different plugins, like I said, for BPF for each one of those. Um, sort of an interesting one we recently added would be stack traces. Um, if you're interested, you can go check it out. We have user space stack traces, and we've had kernel stack um, stack traces for quite a while. 
Um, you can do sort of interesting things like catch seg faults at scale and put them in a database so you can sort of debug um, sort of random seg faults in your network or things that look random and arbitrary, you can kind of get a data set. Um, so th those are some things that Tetragon is doing. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, kind of networking at the BPF side here. Um, so if we think about the networking stack, we start at L7 and we kind of work our way to L3 and L4 and L2. And then I have a sort of a last little bit about a commentary uh, of something we're trying in Tetragon, which I think is interesting for anyone who's building kind of event-based systems where you're trying to detect and enforce things. Um, and then we can talk about next steps. Um, L7 is interesting. Um, why we got to L7, just a little background context, is we basically looked at what, what is going on in the network for L7 today, or before we started building Tetragon. And basically, every packet was going to a proxy that was a user space application. Um, and so what you see is anytime you need to have any observability or enforcement, you basically traverse the TCP IP stack twice, three times, four times as you get out of the system. So there's just a lot of data movement going on here um, and a lot of extra traverse, traversal over the TCP IP stack, which um, you know, if you sort of zoom out far enough, you might ask, like, really, that app wants to send something to the observability. Why, why do I have this extra hop um, of data copies all the way down to the loop back and back up? So that was sort of the original problem statement at L7. Um, and then this very quickly popped up, which is an interesting, I'll talk through the slide. <laughs> There's a lot going on here. Um, but the gist is, um, as soon as you introduce TLS, you lose the ability to observe the traffic flow, right? Like you can't put a hook in the middle of the stack and see the flow because the traffic's encrypted. Um, and what we also see is a trend of people going to, basically, we need to encrypt everything. So if you look at the FedRAMP and the FIP specs, they're all saying, hey, if this data is sensitive. It needs to be encrypted when it leaves the pod, um, roughly, or the container, uh, depending on your language and your exact version <laughs> spec that you're looking at. But the point is that what we're saying is all this traffic needs to be encrypted when, when you do that curl over there. Um, the problem with that is if you also want to say we're going to do security and observability, so you're a security team, now everything that you're observing is encrypted traffic. And you can't say, hey, I want to make sure that um, anytime people talk to this storage bucket in the cloud, that it's a storage bucket that they own. Um, so uh, sort of an interesting aside on that is you can look at the L3 and say, hey, this is going to my storage system. Most storage systems will then look at the HTTP header inside and redirect internally. So there's a sort of a series of known exploits where if you just, just observe L3, it may look like it's going to the right IP, but there's a different host inside the L7, which will then be routed by the L7 router on the other side. Um, so the future that we're trying to build here it, around KTLS and L7 is avoid this sort of proxy by encryption where you have to encrypt, send it to the proxy. The proxy has to have all the keys. Um, so you have a, like a single point of failure here where that's, that's holding a large amount of secret keys for the entire network. Decrypt it, inspect it, re-encrypt it, and send it back out. So you end up with not just data movement, but a, multiple encryption op operations there. Um, so for KTLS in the future, that's, that's kind of the direction we're going. If you can get rid of all of that, you see a huge performance improvement, but also just an overall complexity is removed from the system. I no longer have to worry about this box on the side that's doing the decrypt and holding all the keys. How do I do um, failover on that box? How do I do high availability on that box? Um, because what we want to get to is this model here for L7, where we started with apps, TCP stack, everything bouncing through. Um, and then what we want to get to over here is where we just move all of that observability into the kernel. And the kernel becomes kind of service mesh aware. You get kind of both of those benefits, less copying of data. Um, and then you don't have to worry about um, doing the multiple encrypts. And there's an interesting thing that comes out of this that I think maybe wasn't obvious to, when we, to us when we started. Um, but because that's the kernel, and the kernel's distributed everywhere in the entire network, everything has a kernel, um, you immediately get high availability and sort of load balancing by default, right? Because every kernel is going to do its specific nodes. There's no node in the box that is, is the service mesh kernel, right? It's completely distributed. 
um, which is a nice, nice benefit of this. So that's the setup. You know, like, I guess the last thing was we use SockMap for this. So what does that actually look like from a flow, just to give you some quick perspective on how this works. Um, SockMap is a particular map type. It can have BPF programs attached. So those BPF programs will be like your TLS parsers or your HTTP parsers. You basically create the map and attach the programs. And then every time you see a socket being created or connected, um, we do it on established, but you could do it in other places. We put, we put the, that socket in the map. And once that socket's in the map, it's bound to this BPF program. And so everything that is sent or received over that BPF program will run through, or sorry, over this socket will be sent through this BPF program over here. And basically, why you have to do that is an interesting one because we had multiple proposals um, on like how to make this work. One idea was to use U probes. Um, for example, you could put U probes in the user stack on, on the libraries. It has a couple different problems when you do that. The main one is, well, two of the main ones are we're a security tool, um, and as soon as you start hooking U probes, you're, you're reading user memory, which means the user owns the memory. So there's no guarantee that if a malicious user is not going to change the memory after you read it, isn't going to just sort of avoid your hook altogether, right? Like go around it. Like you hooked OpenSSL, user just decided not to use OpenSSL. Um, so those are kind of the main problems. And then you could go down the stack into a TC hook would be the other direction. You could just say like, I'm going to read TC, I already have a hook there, I'm going to read every data. Problem with TCP is that you're going to get all of the retransmits, you're going to get all of the out of order packets, and you're basically for any sort of payload parser that's looking at HTTP or TLS or any, you know Kafka or any of these protocols, you're going to have to rebuild, um, rebuild that flow, rebuild the payload, understand retransmits, and basically redo what TCP stack is already doing in BPF, um, which you probably maybe could do, but it's it's not a very uh, exciting exercise. And then the, the last piece is for us, um, although sock map doesn't require it as a system, you can delete sockets at any point from the sock map. What we've been doing, uh, and sort of a nice property of sock map, is if the socket is freed through like a close and a time wait, and this is a little bit of a hand wavy explanate box here, but imagine that there's no more references to the socket, it gets removed from the sock map and then the structure gets freed. So you don't have to worry about any reference counting on the socket, and you're, you're not pinning socket resources in the system. So like an alternative approach would be to like increment the reference count, and then at some point you have to monitor the close and then decrement the reference. You don't have to do that with sock map. It'll automatically, when it sees that the reference counts should reach zero because the socket's being destroyed, user called a close on it or a system just abandoned it, you can, uh, it'll automatically be freed, so you don't, you don't have to manage that resource yourself. So we've been using this for quite a while. Um, this is just an example. I think it's too small, but the basic idea is we collect all of the TLS ciphers, all of the algorithms that are being used. We can fire off alarms if you're using um, old algorithms. If you're running TLS 1.1, we'll fire an alert. That's what Tetragon does with, kinda, with that B BPF technology there. Um, so kind of where are we, um, just as an update, kind of where are we as far as like kernel availability and support? Um, BPF Next 6.5 and 6.8 are all in really good shape. They all pass our CI testing, um, which I'll talk about in a second. 6.1 has two patches on the list that are hopefully will be merged shortly and come out in the next point release. Um, that can cause kind of some issues with the send. Um, Basically, those are primarily around kind of corner cases where some applications are using ioctals to see if um, to see if there's any data. <laughs> some web servers will still use ioctals to query if, if they need to read the data. There's an old ioctal for it. Um, and then 5.15 has a couple fixes that we're kind of backporting right now. Um, the really interesting thing I just for people that want to use this is like a lot of the distributions are supporting it now. So we got all um, the Ubuntu's, the GKEs, um, the AKS. I didn't list there, but it is also supported, and all the new Amazon uh, Linux distributions. That's sort of a, a random grab bag. There's probably support in other ones, but those are the ones that um, we test a lot of times. Um, we support both architectures, ARM and x86. Um, and the really interesting, I think, interesting thing from a CI side is we run this, the kernel one, but we also run um, Nginx compliance tests. 
So um, Nginx has a, you know, a many, many tests that it runs as part of its HTTP compliance tests. We run those um, with uh, sock map underneath it. Um, we've actually found quite a few bugs this way. It's where we found the ioctal problem. Um, we've talked about trying to figure out how to get that into self-tests. The only trouble is it runs for quite a while. Um, we have it on a GitHub runner, so whenever we push any code. And we also have a nightly runner on BPF Next and those stable kernels. So every night we test BPF Next against Nginx compliance, some of our CI tests, and then the self-test BPF SOC map. Um, I am working on getting in the BPF SOC map out of BPF SOC map. It gets pretty ancient and it's pretty horrible from a, it's just the code is ugly and it's not much fun to work on. So we'll move that into probe tests pretty soon. Um, I had an RFC at some point that I sent out. I just need to get it completed. So that's kind of the state. Um, if you want to think about things that are, are not particularly nice, or I guess th these things are working. <laughs> this is the working th part. Um, but then the not working part is the, the verdict and the stream parser. So this is an open bug. Um, one of the features of SockMap, if you're not using it, is you can apply a parser. The parser, what it'll do is you can tell it what size of data you want. Um, all of our parsers that we write in Tetragon are streaming parsers, so we read the data as it's coming through. Um, but you can imagine where you, want, you might know the, the payload side ahead of time. You want to say, just give me chunks of what, 1K da data or something. Um, there's an open issue with this. It's actually a, kind of a hard issue to solve. Um, it gets into the weeds a little bit about what TCP does, but TCP uses this copy, copied sequence. Um, what that is supposed to indicate is that the, the data is copied into the receive queue for the socket um, so that the user, when the user reads the data, it's there. Um, it, it's also used for TCP pull, which so, makes somewhat sense. If you copy the data into the receive buffer of the socket, then TCP pull should wake up. That's, that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, makes sense. <laughs> um, but the problem is with our stream parser right now is that it's incrementing that copy sequence before the data is actually in the socket receive queue. Um, we can change it to not delay the update of the re re um, sequence, but then we run into this other problem where the, it has implications on how the ACK, how the ACKing works on the TCP congestion algorithms. Um, and what you risk is if your program says, I want to have something that's larger than the receive window, you can basically hang the TCP session because you're, you're never going to get any acts coming back. Um, so we're working on this one. Uh, I have to figure out what to do about it. One, one thought is to put, delay the copied sequence, but ensure that if we get to some sort of low threshold that we send the data to the parser anyways. The problem then is that you're going to have to write BPF programs that can handle this case. So it, it's sort of a, it's kind of the current state. <laughs> so if you have ideas on this, let me know. Um, the other one that's, that's bothering me a little bit about this is we have zero copy support um, in the kernel now for TX and RX. Um, zero copy for security is questionable. Right? If, if you're trying to write a security application and you want to make your decision after the data has been copied to the, to, the, to the application, nothing's stopping the application from reading the data. So um, what we do is we disable it. Um, basically, don't allow users to turn zero copy on sockets that we're trying to monitor. Um, not a particularly satisfying solution, but that's what we do. Um, it's also, if you want to have like some best effort observability, like you're not a strict security application, you're just trying to observe something, um, it would make sense to allow security because you sort of trust both parties not to uh, be try to use a back channel there. Um, but uh, just another thing that we're trying to fix. Um, and then on the sort of future of this kind of stuff, the, the other feature we have is I pointed out all of this, um, this kind of flow here. We have the sock map there. It's kind of the, the linchpin. Um, but what we've observed is um, for most things, we don't actually need the sock map at all. Like the only reason we're using it is as a mechanism to attach the BPF programs. So the next step is just to get rid of that map entirely. The reason the map is there is most likely because when I created this, 
I had been working on switches, and when you do a load balancer in a switch, you tend to have a T-cam, and then you th that's how you pick your output. Um, I was imagining that people would build sort of KTLS and layer seven load balancers this way. Um, we haven't done it yet. Um, I would be interested, I think, still think it's an interesting idea if somebody wants to build a layer seven load balancer in the kernel. Um, but for, for a lot of our use cases, we can just get rid of that map, which frees up some resources, but also solves kind of like a right sizing process. Um, like how do you pick the size of that map? Also solves yet another problem that the fuzzer um, says but likes to pick on that map and do like loops of adding and deleting sockets for it. And we've had sort of a long list of bugs that I go through and I fix. But um, it's, it's at some point it feels like we're fixing bugs for a use case that doesn't exist, right? We're not using it. Um, the next thing is like KTLS is this vision thing that we want to do. Um, you know, this, this idea where everything's encrypted but the kernel can still read it and enforce security properties. Um, the OpenSSL 3 support is there. 3.0 support is actually becoming a, like default and available everywhere, so that's good. Um, but there's been no addition into like Go or Java or other language libraries at this point. I think Boring SSL might be the only other example of a, of a KTLS supported library, unless I'm, somebody can correct me. There is a PR for the Golang, so we just need to get that going again and get it through. Java, we have a lot of Java applications in the world still, so um, would be nice to get support. There's also DTLS and Quick. That, which raise the same sort of questions. What do we do about these things? Do we just live with these multiple hops, encrypt, decrypt, or do we try to embed those into the kernel as well? There was an RFC for Quick um, on the networking side to put Quick in the kernel. Um, so that's sort of interesting as an offload. Um, I think their motivation was the, as an offload. Um, my sort of motivation is like security um, over encrypted data. Um, and then sort of quickly, I can go through a couple other things we do as we work down the stack. So we have the L3 stack that we do. Um, we basically monitor every process and how much data it sends and all this kind of fun stuff. So you get, you can build these kind of graphs where you say like how many segments and how many bytes per um, application, per destination, slice your data in multiple ways. Um, you can do latency stuff here. We put timestamps in the packets and, and watch the latency. Um, but this is an interesting problem that popped up, and I'm hoping that like Arena and GoTo and stuff like this will help us solve this one. Um, if you want to write an enforcement policy, you end up with things like this, um, where you say like, here's my uh, application. Um, I want any port, and I want it to ebpf.io, but I want this application on 4.4.3 to be allowed anywhere, and oh, by the way, anything can use port 80. Um, so it, you know, coming from sort of a hardware background, you might think, oh, that would be great for a TCAM, but we're on the CPU, we don't have a TCAM. So the sort of to-do here is understand sort of the algorithm trade-offs. There are better ways to do this. Right now, we just do a bunch of hash table lookups. I believe, sort of intuitively, I don't have any data, that there's some better ways to do this. Um, I know there's a few, too few like academic papers on how to do this. There's definitely a trade-off at some point where you get so many wild cards, you're doing so many hash lookups, you're causing, causing an overhead. So if anybody's got, got some good ideas here, let me know. This is an interesting, um, interesting problem that we are actually hitting in practice now. I would say uh, also so sometimes uh, you get IP addresses in there and you might need like an LPM kind of match. So yes. I think in Cilium we end up doing like an LPM including the web client part, which <laughs> we don't actually need to do an LPM at that level. We're just So we kind of have this like binary tree that's like encoding that. So we're not optimizing that aspect either. So I think there's... So basically you were saying there's a, there, sometimes you end up with yet another field here, which is the CIDR, which can also be wild. Yeah, like, I, we just have it all in one, one map, right? So yeah. that, like, it's definitely room for us to optimize even with existing stuff, I think, but um, I guess sure, like, the, but you like, don't you're have... thinking like TCAM with these things are wild carded. Um, I guess what I'm saying is there may even be a use case to have LPM as part of that or like... Yeah, so I, I maybe skipped over. We actually, I, I just dropped it from this example. We do have also have a CIDR that sits in front of this that we use an LPM for. But it's like a very staged approach, right? Like you do a hash lookup. Okay, oh, I need to do an LPM lookup. If, there's a, if it's a wildcard LPM like all these would be, then I don't need to do the lookup. So you just end up with a very 
um, ad hoc, at least in, in our site, it's a very ad hoc development of a sort of a pipeline. Um, and my just intuition is that, that there's some discipline could be applied here and you could build a better, a better system. Um, especially as the wildcard counts go up higher and higher. Cool, I'll, I'll keep moving because I'm slow on time. The last, the sort of last thing I really wanted to harp on, because this is something that, that seemed like it should be trivial, but it actually is causing us lots of grief, um, is understanding like details of this L2 block. So you have a NIC down there with some queues, and right now the only thing that the OS will give you by default is TX and RX bytes and drops and errors. These are like the standard thing, but they're for the entire NIC block. Um, and what we see is a customer will say, well, my NIC has some errors, but my throughput is too, um, isn't this high or something like this. And it, it, it could just be that like one specific queue is overrun. And this is usually has to do with like a bad queue mapping for an application. You end up with a bunch of applications pinned to a CPU, they're all banging on one core, and they end up on one queue, that queue overruns. But we really have no way to tell you right now at sort of any sort of scale, like what queue that is specifically and, and why. Um, so there's a couple things we need in BPF that um, I think Daniel will mention um, is like this NetNS and dev iterators are missing. We need a way to iterate through the network namespaces, iterate through the devs, just basically pull that stats out. But then we also need the device drivers to give us something reasonable. We know they have all this interesting data down in the hardware and even in the driver, they just don't expose it or they expose it as strings, which is very, very painful for me because then I have to parse strings in VPF, right? Um, and also drivers independent strings, which is also a problem. So every driver will have different strings. Um, so that's my NIC complaint. My next complaint is the same problem, but at the QDisk layer, we built a POC where we do QDisk occupancy. So you want to know like, hey, how full are the QDisks? I have FQ Caudal and I want to sort of get a sense of this Q on this is 50% is full and this one's 75% full or something. Um, and basically we were trying to find buffer bloat and tail latency at, at sort of in a cluster. Um, I was able to do it with a K probe, but the K probe introduced like too much overhead. Um, TC would be nice, but TC doesn't let you do a BPF probe reads right now back into the QDisk. So um, it's not obvious to me that doing probe reads to find your QDisk stats is particularly a good idea either. Um, so this is something we're working on. I don't know if anybody has a, has a good example, but we were building sort of time in queue for, for like SKBs and then QDisk occupancy histograms so we could track how, how um, basically we're trying to, like I said, find some latency statistics out of the QDisk. What you want to basically find out is, is the latency in the QDisk, is the latency, um, is the latency in the NIC, or is the latency in the, in the socket, um, or is the latency in the, in the network. And so basically if you see a spike in latency in your, um, in your application, you're trying to figure out who to blame. Do I blame the so layer four? Do I blame layer seven? Do I blame layer two? Or do I go find my switch people and try to figure out why, why I'm seeing latency in the core of the network? Um, we've started to get there, but I'm, you know, we're, we need a few of these missing pieces to really nail it down. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say um, fairly quickly, is one thing we've observed is that this model that we've built with Tetragon is sort of getting to its limits. Uh, and that this is basically the model that all of these observability tools fo follow. You basically, in BPF, you hook to your interesting events, you apply some filters, and you push those events up through the ring buffer. Um, and then very similar, then user space reads the ring buffer. Um, you do something to it, and then you push it to a pipeline or DB or anything behind you. This is just sort of like the generic model of all observability tools. Um, one thing we're finding in Tetragon specifically is that this model starts to break down um, if you want to sort of observe, keep a very low overhead profile, very low memory, um, but you, you don't want to push every event because that wakes everything up in the user space. Every time you push something, you're waking user space up, it's reading the, it's reading the ring, the overhead's high, and then you're pushing a lot of stuff at this, this pipeline and database. So what we're starting to do is go to a pull model where we just move all of this stuff down into BPF, cut out the ring buffer so there's no more ring buffer to read. All of the, the sort of business logic gets pushed into, into BPF, and then 
um, the pipeline and database just directly reads the BPF map, which makes our user space this super small thing that's just grabbing maps and shoving them into gRPC pipelines. Um, what's really interesting is we're really going to start pushing on like what we can do in BPF, and that's where we get like I think some of the arena stuff is going to be useful. If you think about doing digests in BPF, um, you know, windowed kind of windowed statistics, kind of all these interesting interesting algorithms. So so stay tuned. We're just starting this process, but. I think it's the it's kind of the next evolution is that that agent gets smaller and smaller and does less and less and is really just the pipeline between BPF and then the database. Um, so with that, that's just a sort of a vision thing. Um, with that, thanks. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to happy to answer anything. Right. How would you see like the stat problem resolved? Like, I mean, talking to vendors, coming up with a unified. Yeah, I have two theories on this. One is we get in a room and we all talk about it. The other theory is I have a Mellanox NIC and an Intel NIC and a couple other NICs under my desk. I might just start pushing patches. Like I've, I've talked, I've been in this room, talked about this for years, and it's never happened. So I think I might just build the stats I want, and then. Um, the BPF hooks to read them with the dev iterator, uh, maybe a kfunk to grab them, and then just add the code to the drivers. Because like, all of the drivers have interesting stuff in these strings. They just don't it, give them to us. It, it's been improved right now in like NetNext. With the so QAPI? The, the, yeah, with, yeah, with the QAPI, there's a like, yeah. push to get these stats out of these strings right. and into you know, these like, YAML right. defined, and there's a like, consistent interface right. for you to, to kind of pull these stats out. So. Yeah, I, I didn't. There's I definitely progress in that area, and I think that's yeah. probably going to be relevant to, to 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 you. Yeah, I saw the QAPI patches. Um, I think they're only on the Millinox NICs right now, right? Or yeah, so like, yeah, yeah. it's about pushing that all to the other NICs, mm -hmm. and then if we have the BPF iterators, we would also maybe want a QAPI iterator where we could iterate over the queues and collect the stats, right? Something like this. Um, we, we'll definitely poke at it because it's a, it's a, actually a. The problem we have right now is we can't tell very well if the packet was dropped by the NIC or it was dropped by the network. Um, and so but that question, um, if you think about like as a system, one thing we're trying to say is like, is this a network problem or is this a host problem? Because those are two teams and we need to figure out who the right person to, just like who do we find to help fix the problem? Um, and right now that's like kind of the last leg where we don't have a good visibility. It's either got dropped by the NIC or it got dropped by the network. We know it got there because we saw it at layer three get pushed to that dev. Um, and we know that that dev maybe had some drops, but it's really hard to say like that drop correlates to this layer three socket, basically, this application. So um, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll dig into it, I think. Yeah, one comment on this wildcard lookups. So um, there is no magic and all these universal algorithms, they actually also break all these rules into several buckets. So. Either it's like several hash lookups or several LPM lookups or something like this. So, if you can implement your like particular wild card like scheme into several hash lookups, then it's probably the optimal thing. <laughs> Maybe unfortunately it's noticeable at 100 gigs, right? And this bothers me. So, I, I don't know. The guys got this fancy hardware, right? They've never we've never found a good use for it. Maybe we can f figure something out. I'm not sure. <laughs> I just I just want to get rid of you know that 10% overhead, right? So do you think um, BPF QDisk will solve your uh, QDisk observability uh, problem? So in BPF QDisk you have the queue which is implemented using BPF list. So BPF. I mean, uh, maybe if it if it's a way to hook in and get the right stats out of it. Um, the trouble is, I'm not entirely, like the K probe stat, we can get the tail, like we can start to look for that buffer bloat kind of problem where the queues are getting big. We can do that with a K probe today, just the overhead is too expensive. So if, if the BPF program's already running and it collects that stats or at runtime, or we just put the stats in the queue disk directly already, maybe that's something. The, the trouble we have is like polling is always, it, we miss things when we do polling. So like we turn polling on, it's like how often do you want to poll? Right? And then you're like using too much CPU. If you back off, you might miss it, miss the blip. So you'll get like a latency event, and you go like, I wonder if the Q disk was full when this happened, and maybe the time on the queue was too high. 
um, by the time you query the stack, the QDisk for that right now, you're, you're too late, right? Um, so, so maybe there's like a window or like an edge detection you could do in the QDisk layer, where you say if it's over a certain threshold, fire an event or something. Um, yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.